The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Thank you for joining us again on Ask the Expert. We're here with Dan Cates. Dan is an instructor at the Memphis School of Preaching in Memphis, Tennessee. He has a master's degree from, uh, what's the university? Amherst University. Amherst University. And uh, he has a master's in biblical studies. And he teaches at the Memphis School of Preaching. He teaches uh, Greek and English, as well as some other courses. We've been in a, an interesting study on uh, something called Bible gramming. Uh, Bible gramming is basically diagramming sentences from the Bible. And so as we left off last time, we were uh, discussing some things having to do with the assembly. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 verses 23 through 25. And why it is important for us as Christians to assemble with the saints. And uh, I don't know if you have anything else you want to say about that. If you want to move into what we're going to do next. Well, it's important for us to assemble. We saw that not forsaking the assembling had other ramifications uh, other than simply, I, I, I missed. Right. Why don't we spend a few minutes thinking about in the assembling itself, what, what's taking place while we're worshiping. Let's go to Colossians 3, 16. Colossians 3, 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We see in this particular verse, the, the main clause is, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And that's going to be diagrammed the same way that we diagrammed uh, the first part of uh, Hebrews 10.23 and Hebrews 10.24. We have the understood you, and I'm going to write that over here and have a pretty long area before we get to the verb because there's a lot that's associated okay. with the you. Now the verb was here in Colossians 3.16. Again, you let. And we ask the question, let what? The answer to that question is seen in another clause here. Let word of Christ dwell. Okay. So we have a direct object. That's why we have this shorter line here. Let word dwell. Which word? Well, the answer to that question is the word and the prepositional phrase of Christ. Let the word of Christ dwell where? In you. Okay. And then we saw uh, in all wisdom dwell how? In wisdom, how much wisdom, which all. wisdom, and so forth, all wisdom. Now we'll get to the latter part of that verse in just a second, but this is, this is pretty simple. Okay. On, on the outset, let's just review some of the things that we've learned earlier in this series. Good idea. Uh, on this side of this cross, if you will, we have the subject. This particular subject is an understood you. This is Colossians 3.16. Paul is talking to the members of the church which was in Colossae, which was located in modern-day Asia Minor, okay. the Roman province of Asia. So he's saying you, the Colossians, let. Okay, let is an action verb. We saw that earlier. Let us provoke one another to love and to good works and so forth. This is an action verb. Now, the question, what? Well, what is a question that we ask when we have an action verb? What is receiving the action? Or what is taking place? You let word. Word is the subject of this clause. This whole clause is serving as the direct object. Okay. 
This is the subject of the clause. This is the action verb of the clause. We're describing word. There's only one word. Right. There's only one, uh, one message which God has intended. Of course, we understand from Re Revelation 22, 18 and 19, we don't need to add to it, take away from it. And we recognize from Galatians 1, 3 through 5, that, that there's nothing in addition to it. Right. So this is the word. That's our definite article. That's an adjective which limits. This is the word. Okay. And which word of Christ? Let the word of Christ dwell where, we might ask. And the answer to where is in you. That is, in those who are members of the church. Okay. Dwell how, we might ask. And the answer to that question is in wisdom. Which wisdom? Or what kind of wisdom? All wisdom. Okay. So that's the basic thought. Okay, so we're, we're, we're just talking about at the moment uh, Christians who are, uh, we're talking about last time the assembly, and so now we're here in the assembly together. We're in the assembly. Okay. And here we have ones who were letting this happen. Okay. Now what did we say participles did? We said participles describe nouns or pronouns. Okay. Here the participles, and there are going to be three of them, are describing the ones who are letting the word dwell in them with all wisdom. Okay. What are the characteristics of the one who is going that route? Uh -huh. What is the characteristic of one who not only is a Christian, but we're in the assembly, one who is worshiping correctly? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Notice three words here which end in ing's, which look like verbs. Okay. Teaching admonishing, singing. We'll notice as we diagram these next three parts, pardon me, no, diagram these next three parts, that the one who is letting the world of Christ, Christ dwell in him in all wisdom is the one who is teaching and admonishing his brethren and is the one singing with grace in his hearts. Okay. Let's begin by laying out these participles. Participles, as we have noted a number of times, are verb forms ending in ing, in this case, or ed, d, e, n, n, or t, used as adjectives. You, teaching. This is the teaching one. We see admonishing. Admonishing would be the idea of strengthening, maybe verbally strengthening, okay. building up uh, your brethren. It would carry to some degree the idea of edifying, teaching and admonishing. And then we see and singing. And you can already begin to see where we're going right. as we look more closely into this verse. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing. Okay, we see the equality of teaching and admonishing. You know, sometimes we have people that, uh, that they, they don't want to fulfill all the roles that a Christian should fulfill. So maybe they're faithful in one area, they're unfaithful in others. We really need to appreciate that Christians should be well-rounded. Right. And even though Christians may not be taking an active role leading the singing or something right. like that, if Christians are singing, if they are participating, what that's going to do, that, that's going to help to teach their brethren. Right. We see here in a moment singing as well. Teaching and admonishing one another. Okay, teaching and admonishing whom? And the answer to that question is another. Another is expressly stated after admonishing, but it's understood here as well. Teaching another, admonishing another, which another? One another. one another. Now, teaching and admonishing one another, how? And we'll build these off of admonishing. They apply to teaching as well. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is a prepositional phrase showing where this is being done. I'll put just a little X there to indicate that it's, it's the same thing. Okay. In Psalms, hymns, 
hymns. That's effectively saying in psalms, in hymns. Okay. And spiritual songs. Teaching in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Well, these are songs which are spiritual. Spiritual is an adjective Describe. modifying songs. What type of songs? Okay, the one who, who is participating in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is building up those who are around him. He's teaching those who are around him. Right. He's admonishing those who are around him. And this is an important thing, especially when we consider passages that talk about what roles uh, Christians may play. Uh, for instance, men, they can serve a role as far as leadership functions are concerned. They can serve a role as far as being in front of the congregation. Right. The Bible says that women aren't to take that type of lead. They're not to be right. uh, leading in the worship services, leading singing, praying, things of that nature. But that doesn't mean that they cannot take a role, and it doesn't mean that they cannot teach. That's right. When a woman is singing, what is she doing? She's teaching and admonishing. Okay. But she's doing so not taking a leadership role. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. When we participate in worship, we're doing what we saw earlier. We are exhorting one another in Hebrews 10, 25. Now, singing, this likewise, is going to be a participle. Singing how? We see with grace... What type of grace? Well, grace in your hearts. And uh, where? To the Lord. Singing with grace in your hearts. There's not really an obvious place for to the Lord. It's not that this is saying singing to the Lord. It's not necessarily that it's saying with grace to the Lord. But what the indication is, especially from where this is placed, it is it's as though your hearts are pointed to the Lord. Okay. Okay. The hearts are focused uh, on what He desires. Right. So here we see the state of the one who is letting the Word of Christ dwell in him richly in all wisdom. He's teaching his brethren. He's admonishing his brethren. He's singing with the right attitude. Right. You may remember John 4.24 God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Right. Spirit and truth are, are so vitally important. Spirit would carry the idea of the attitude being right. Truth would carry the idea of the action being right. right. Okay. We, we serve the Lord with the right attitudes, and we serve the Lord with the right means. Well, let's identify the, these particular words from a grammatical Stance now. We identified those. Right. Teaching, admonishing, and singing are all participles. And we said that participles are adjectives. So these are adjectives describing you, describing the Colossian brethren to whom Paul was writing. Teaching and admonishing another. This is answering the question what? This is the direct object or object of the participle. Just like a regular verb can take a direct object, a verbal can take a direct object. Okay. So admonishing another, which another, one another, worship is reciprocal. Uh -huh. we, are, we are certainly worshiping God. We're singing praises to God. We're praying, God, praying to God. And of course, as... We're in worship. We're reading His Word. So God is speaking to us through His Word. But not only is the worship this way, but the worship is this way. Okay. If we notice this with Hebrews 10, 23-25, if I'm not at worship, I'm not the only one suffering. Right. My brother is the one who is suffering as well. So, teaching and admonishing whom? Another. Which another? One another. This is an adjective. And then we see how. How are we admonishing one another? In is a preposition. So here we see a prepositional phrase used as an adverb, okay. modifying our verbal admonishing. 
Psalms is a noun serving as the object of the preposition, a coordinating conjunction, joins hymns, serving as the object of the preposition, another coordinating conjunction joins songs, serving as the object of the right. preposition. What types of songs? Well, spiritual songs. And this is an adjective. Now, different ones ha have done different word studies on what psalms right. means, what hymns means, what songs means. That. And that's really beyond the scope uh, of a, a grammar approach okay. to this particular uh, verse. Just understand that there are different types of songs that we sing in worship. Some songs are, are songs which are taken from Scripture. Right. Some songs are songs wh which maybe are designed to draw an emotional appeal. Some songs are songs which are designed to teach a lesson, though, though they may not necessarily come from a particular verse. Right. So this just indicates there's a variety of songs. And these are things, though, wh which will help to edify okay. one another. And then we saw singing. And we asked the question, how? How are we singing with grace? What type of grace? Grace in hearts. What type or what kind? This is an adverb phrase, preposition object. Mm -hmm. This is an adjective phrase, preposition object. Adverb phrase because it's modifying a verbal. Adjective phrase because it's modifying a noun. Oh, okay. uh, which hearts? I wrote you, you. Your hearts. In your hearts. Which hearts? This is an adjective. And then we saw to the Lord. Now. As we mentioned, singing could be to the Lord, could be right. with grace to the Lord. But at the very least, I think that we, can, we could all agree that our hearts need to be of the, right, to the of the right type. So we view this as an adjective phrase, to Lord. Which one? Again, this is the definite article, right. okay. just the Lord. So we, uh, so we, at least I think what I've learned anyway is when I'm doing this, sort of like what we talked about earlier in, uh, in Acts 22, 16, when I'm, when I'm doing these, these things, I'm fulfilling this. Okay. Is, that, is this or, correct? Or? or more correctly, if I'm doing this, if, if I'm, I'm letting this happen, right. I'm characterized as the teaching, admonishing, and singing one. Okay. okay? If, if I'm not this one, that's not going to happen. If I'm not doing this, I'm not this one. Okay. So it works both ways. But yeah, th this describes the person. Okay. This doesn't show what, what he's doing. This describes him. Okay. And this shows the action. Okay. So here we are. We're in worship. And we've, we've learned from the last show that uh, we need to be there uh, because it's uh, for us. To, it's for our own good. It's for our, our brethren's own good. And it shows that we're not wavering uh, in what we're doing. And now we're here, and as we're here, we're allowing uh, or letting the Word dwell in us. This, does this specifically only apply to the worship service, or would you say that this has, uh, we let the Word dwell in us daily, or, or this specific verse really is in application to inside the uh, worship assembly? Well, grammatically, uh, this, you, know, you, you take it, from the context right. that it's in, and so it has to do with worship. Certainly, it's the case, though, if we are living the Christian life, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be accomplishing things which edify our brethren because we're, we're going to be living right. Okay. We're going to be doing the right things. We're going to uh, be associating with those who are righteous and so okay. forth. And so, so some of the principles are, are true out of worship, uh, but... As far as the verse itself, you're talking about a time when these things are taking place. Right. Okay. All right. Well, very good. And uh, is this, have we covered this uh, verse Yeah, that, that verse, is, that verse okay. is covered. All right. Now, is there, any, is there another verse that you'd like to start? And, and if we do get through it, then that's great. And if we don't, we'll, we'll, of course, pick it up on the next time. Well, I'd like to talk about James 1.27. Okay. But James 1.27 is something in which, which we may devo devote more of the uh, of uh, one show to. Okay. If I may, if we have a minute, I might bring up uh, uh, an example of a place where if we can look at a 
particular section analytically, if we can analyze it a bit, sure. we can get a better appreciation of what is being said. I'd like to go to Romans 2, verses 7 through 10, if I may. Sure. Romans 2, 7 through 10. In this particular passage, we have something, uh, something which is really beautiful when you uh, break it down and see exactly what it's saying. Here we see that God is going to reward righteousness and He's going to punish wickedness. Now this verse is worded in a way though, especially in the uh, King James Version, which can be a little, uh, little difficult to pick out. Okay. You'll notice after verse 8, there's in the King James Version, and there may be in other English versions, a comma. If you were to go to a Greek Bible, the Greek New Testament, you would see that there is a colon or semicolon following verse 8. A colon or semicolon indicate a break in thought. Okay. They're not as strong a break in thought as a period would be. A period is a complete break in thought. A comma is not a break in thought so much. If it is, it's, it's very weak because a comma can actually join things which right. are equal. Here, a better punctuation would be that, which was found in the original, having either a colon or semicolon. But what we see in verse 7 is that God is going to reward those who are doing well. Okay. You'll notice to them who by patient continuance in well-doing. And what is the reward they are going to receive? They're going to receive the last two words of that verse, eternal life. Okay. If you go down to verse 10, you see that same thing restated. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good. Who's receiving the reward there? The one that works good. What is the reward? Glory, honor, and peace. So verses 7 and 10, this is in Romans 2, verses 7 and 10 are equal. Okay. Now, verses 8 and 9 in the English version just look to be one thought if okay. we just take a cursory glance. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish. Upon every soul of man that doeth evil, the Jew first, and also the Gentile. Right. Well, uh, reading through that wouldn't necessarily see a break with right. that comma. But let's read it this way. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, mm -hmm. tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Verses 8 and 9 are not one thought. They are, just like verses 7 and 10, two equal thoughts. In verse 7, we saw to those who are doing well, eternal life. Verse 10, to those who work good, glory, honor, and peace. In verse 8, we see to them that are contentious and don't obey, indignation and wrath. In verse 9, we see to that one who does evil, tribulation and anguish. Okay. So the comma could throw us off, but having an understanding of how the English language works and and how these things can fit together, it's really quite easy to pick out what's so being said. So what, what do we gain what, uh, as we're doing this English for the purpose of helping us with our Bible study? What, what do we gain by, by knowing the differences in commas and colons and, and specifically with, with this passage here? Well, here we just see something that's very beautiful. Uh, we see a harmony in Paul's writing. Pa Paul, you'll remember, was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. This means that he, he was educated by one of, the, uh, one of the most brilliant Jews of his day. Right. And as such, Paul gained a great deal of knowledge as well. And when Paul writes that this knowledge comes out, and unfortunately those who translated some of these passages didn't necessarily word them correctly or, or sometimes put a comma where there didn't need to be one. The, the English Bible is... Excellent. You can certainly read the English Bible. You can gain understanding from it. You can find out how you need to be saved. But there's some nuances with the language right. that you really appreciate more 
if you can look at these passages and break them down. And this is about two contrasts. Okay. A harmony between two verses talking about the reward for good. And because you had two verses about the reward for good, you've got two verses about the reward or punishment for okay. evil as well. Now, that doesn't have anything to do with what we've heard of Hebrew parallelism or anything like that. It's well, different, right? Well, it, it's... Uh, I would say it's probably similar to okay. Hebrew parallelism. Generally, we associate Hebrew parallelism uh, with the Psalms and right. the Proverbs, where you have one clause which leads to another clause. May maybe the second clause is antithetic. It's got a different idea. Maybe it's synonymous. It has the same idea re -ex uh, expressed in different terms. I think you could say this is a, a type of parallelism, although it's not poetry. Right, right. But it certainly is... Uh, Paul being Paul. Right. Paul speaking in a manner that is very logical. Right. Okay, and so we see uh, clearly then that there's going to be uh, one reward for the righteous, those who do good, one reward for those who don't. That's uh, right. Okay. Well, and it's good. really emphasized there in that passage. And if we, uh, if we have another minute or so, that uh, calls to mind what we were mentioning Yesterday, and I forget right off the top of my head, uh, the passage where we saw, I believe it was uh, First Thessalonians or Second Thessalonians, to them rest. Yes. Rest is what the reward is going to be. Uh, to you who are troubled, rest right. with us. Second Thessalonians 1. Right. one that's right, Second Thessalonians 1. Uh, so that passage has the same idea. Right. There's going okay. to be rest for those who are troubled. Right. There's going to be tribulation for those who are doing the troubling. And so we've... Uh, in the last show and this show, at least if I can put it together in my mind, and, and you certainly throw in what you feel necessary as well, we've learned that we, uh, first of all, we need to be attending services as, as faithful Christians uh, for ourselves, but also for our brethren, sure. so that we can uh, not waver in what we're doing. Uh, then while we're there, we need to let the word of Christ dwell in us, and then we saw the different things there uh, that we need to do. And then also, just from what we said, uh, there's consequences for doing it, consequences for not doing it. That's right. Okay, well, thank you very much again for being here with us today. Uh, we will uh, be back next time with more Bible gramming. We thank you. We thank Dan Cates for guiding us through this. If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth For The World, P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia, 30096, the United States of America, or visit us online at tftw.org. The preceding program was a production of Truth For The World, a work of the Duluth Church of Christ.